anybody, anybody here? Come on out. sudden mood changes, behaviors, or suicidal thoughts. Antidepressants may increase these risks in young adults. Elderly dementia patients have increased risk of death or stroke. Report fever, confusion, stiff, or uncontrollable muscle movements, which may be life-threatening or permanent. These aren't all of the serious side effects. Catalyta can help you let in the light. Ask your doctor about Catalyta. Find savings and support at Catalyta.com.
fly through. said that I would be needing to learn as much about science as possible, and also he gave me a keen interest in UFOs and ancient civilizations. I was taught to spend a lot of time looking into the stone monuments around the world. He told me that was very important. He also wanted me to understand what these craft were that this phenomena was emanating from. Very powerful event happened when I was five years old, where I woke up in the middle of the night and I was floating over my own body. My body was alive, I was floating over myself in bed, and I could see myself. 
himself sleeping. But interestingly enough, my after form or ghost body, as I thought of it at the time, had the same pajamas on that I was wearing in the bed. So I'm literally looking down at myself, seeing myself sleep, and I then floated down the hallway, feet first. I felt as if there were voices talking. I felt a very strong energetic presence. And then I stopped at the stairwell that I would normally be walking downstairs to. And at that point, on its own, my body turned 90 degrees and then tilted up on a diagonal angle. What's the matter, sweetie? As I then searched with fear, thinking, oh my god, I'm dying. The experience suddenly terminated, and I was not able to go any farther. However, I've come to believe that most likely I did have more experience after that moment in the stairwell, but that I was spliced back into my body without the memory being in consciousness. It's okay, I girl. This out of body experience compelled me to try to get another chance. So for two years after this happened, every night, I prayed to get another chance to fly out of my body, meet the old man in person, quote unquote, instead of in a dream. After two years, I broke down and told my mother what happened, and she was progressive enough to tell me that what had happened to me was one of a series of things called extrasensory perception, or ESP. So literally, I'm a seven-year-old kid, and I went underneath the stairwell in the basement of my house, a whole row of paperback books, one of which said ESP in big capital letters. The title was How to Make ESP Work for You by Harold Sherman. I started reading the book. I was in second grade. Most kids were reading Clifford the Big Red Dog. I did not understand many of the words, so I had to use content. So I was able to get through the book. For me, reading people's minds, knowing what they were thinking, that was common for me. I was very aware came out of their mouth. I was very attentive to the eyes, the body language, the ambiance and the nuance of the particular environment I was in. All of these things in my early childhood seemed to be anomalous until you started talking to certain insiders, at which point you realize this fits in with a greater mosaic. And it suggests that like many others on Earth, I'm not suggesting that I'm unique here, there was extensive extraterrestrial contact still to this day I have not been able to recover the memory. Everyone in the UFO community is faced with a seemingly outrageous challenge to try to make sense out of the enormity of material that there is to study. How do you effectively navigate and force through an incredible body of material that encompasses many different ancient civilizations megalithic architecture of giant stones? How do you bring in the element of secret societies and the occult ceremonies that are taking place within these societies? What is the relationship between those secret societies and the governance of our modern world at the elite level? Is there a deep state? Is there some sort of supranational cult that is actually controlling the world? And then, how does this knowledge gel with the concept of a spontaneous quantum leap in human evolution that could be coming our way. A good starting point for this esoteric investigation is to rethink everything that we thought we knew about this. My name is Michael Primo. I'm a researcher human origins and antiquity, and that has led me into other questions related to human origins, evidence that goes beyond the timelines that modern science now accepts. Some people use the term UFARs. That means out-of-place artifacts. According to to what most scientists now believe <laughs> humans existed in a very <laughs> primitive state for many hundreds of thousands of years, human ancestors like Australia, <laughs> and our boy they are the tall and so on. Mm-hmm. <laughs> 
that's my lucky. originated on the planet Venus when it was Earth-like. They are similar to us, as in third density, or third dimensional, if you will. And they said that they date back 2.6 billion years ago. Now that is amazing, because we didn't know about the Kirchdorf spheres back in 1981, when this came through. And yet, the dating they gave in the Law of One for when they were third dimensional like us is exactly the same as the geological dating of the clerk 
absorb spears. And best of all, in the Law of One, they said they had a particular affinity for the pyramid shape, and they built it extensively. Therefore, it does appear that the solution to the mystery of who is the ancient builder race is that this is the group now identifying itself as Ra, the group that gave us the Law of One material, the same group that ultimately contacted Corey Good, appearing as blue avians, now appearing in sixth density, billions of years later, after they were like us. They are apparently the most evolved extraterrestrial group that has ever been involved with humanity. So one of the few things that we do know about this ancient lunar race is that they had created this giant defensive grid around this local stellar neighborhood that we're a part of. 52 local stars clustered together. And they had created these giant Death Star types of uh, ships that were the size of moons and planets that set up a grid around the entire local star cluster that prevented any types of intruders from coming. And this grid was in place and kept our local stellar neighborhood safe from intruders for billions of years. It does appear, based on some very understated things they say in the Law of One, that they had quite the vast civilization that they spread out to many neighboring stars. This is the ancient builder race. They colonized all the neighboring stars in our solar system. Then you have to ask yourself, what could have survived for more than two billion years? Well, this is very fascinating because throughout our solar system, according to insiders, we have a cosmic junkyard. What is the junkyard? It is a collection of crystalline ruins. These ruins are made of a glass-like material, and the material is not actually glass. It is a transparent aluminum alloy. There have already been alloys of transparent aluminum made by various companies here on Earth. And when they stress test these alloys, they find out that they are five times stronger in their tensile strength than bulletproof glass. As our secret space program has apparently gone beyond our solar system with reverse engineered technology similar to what they acquired in the Roswell crash over 70 years ago now, they found that all of the approximately 54 different stars in our own local group of stars, which are all <laughs> gravitationally connected, every <laughs> one of those stars has planets and moons and satellites with these same crystal <laughs> obelisks, pyramids, and domes. By the comet is an asteroid. Visit the moon of Mars. A monolith. They're a very unusual structure on this object. It goes around Mars once in seven hours. When people find out about that, they say, Look, put that there. Obelisks, pyramids, and domes only constitute what is visible on the surface. The ancient builder race spent a lot more energy building inside these moons and planets. We're talking about vast regions that are habitable, where all you really have to do is seal off the door to the outside and reintroduce air pressure. And now you have pressurized an environment that can be occupied by human beings. What I believe is that in 1976, when Viking did this incredible in of the NASA Red and Nectar for going to Mars with Search for Life, and they then never followed up. It's a set of pictures, two separate sets of frames at two different sun angles that show a collection of pyramids, an astounding geometric regularity in this, in this layout. We don't have to prove their artifacts. All we have to do is provide probable cause to suspect they could be, and then the ethics of science say you've got to go and test. When you go back to the original NASA imagery the Martian surface from 1976, hey. there are two frames that <laughs> really matter. There's 35A76 and there's 7015. <laughs> when you compare what is on these two frames, you can clearly see the city of what obviously appears to be pyramids, which apparently again were emulations of the ancient builder race crystal pyramids that they had found throughout our solar system and beyond. There is a gigantic pyramid, estimated to be a mile and a half wide, 
And this pyramid is clearly pentagonal, five-sided. But what is even more fascinating than that is that there are two of the five corners at the top of the pyramid that are narrower than the others. And when you actually look at the pyramid, it is the five-star human pattern of the human body. You can superimpose the Vitruvian man on top of what they call the DNM pyramid on Mars, and it precisely fits. Now, what does that mean? That means the five-sided pyramid on Mars is anthropomorphic. It is a human image. It is a pyramid built in the image of the human body. So believe it or not, pyramids and obelisks have been found on the moon, on Mars, and on other moons and satellites throughout our solar system that are very damaged and very, very old, over two billion years old. This civilization that was on Mars was very aware of the ancient builder race and that these ruins, as their civilization evolved, they discovered they were very extensive. They were always made of this transparent aluminum crystal. And there are many places you can go where you can go inside a moon and find enormous cities worth of space. I'm Dr. Michael Sala. I'm the author of the Secret Space Program book series. I'm investigating ways to introduce information concerning classified technologies that have been suppressed from the general public for decades and are now going to be released, we think, in the very short future. Some of you might be asking, well, how could giant bases be built on the moon? Well, you know, according to a group of Japanese scientists that released a paper in 2017, that giant caverns have been discovered in the moon and that one of these caverns is big enough to house the entire metropolitan region of Philadelphia within it. I'm in peace, boy. that came after them worshipped them as gods. They would emulate their architecture. The people who were on Mars, which we call the progenitor race, they actually built their own structures that were very similar to what they had found all throughout our solar system. We had Tiamat, which they say is a, basically a supermassive Earth. And we had a Maldek, which was Mars, much smaller than Earth, but it was behaving as a moon around Tiamat. Two different civilizations had developed, and they were very similar. The uh, beings on Tiamat, um, they, they all had these elongated skulls that we've seen in uh, 
various uh, studies. But they were slightly different. The, uh, the beans on Tiamat were slightly taller and had different shaped skulls. The beans on Maldek were slightly skinnier and smaller and, again, had slightly different skulls, but they were genetically related. They were considered basically cousins and they had royal families from both sides that were in competition with each other and war with one another. So at some point, this group that we call the pre adamites they entered into warfare with another civilization that is in our Local 52 star cluster. And they developed this plan to harness the ancient builder race grid and to use it as a weapon against their enemies. And this grid, it works through what we call the cosmic web. Every star, every planet is connected with an electromagnetic filament. And that's how portal travel works. You travel through these electromagnetic filaments. And it's been used by some top scientists. So it is an idea which actually had currency in the last century, in the 19th century. And for those who care to go back into history and look at uh, the major scientific journals of that period, you will notice that articles on the electrical nature of comets and uh, the possible electrical activity on the sun were uh, topics of discussion. Unfortunately, in the early uh, part of the 20th century, all of that was more or less uh, suppressed. Something that, of course, we are brought up to believe, and that is that gravity is the controlling influence in the universe. It's what causes the planets to orbit around the sun, and the moon around the earth, and to cause the tides upon the earth. All of that is true up to a point, but the thing to remember is that, basically, there is no understanding of gravity. Einstein's theory doesn't explain gravity. It has matter somehow affecting space in a way which is completely unphysical, in other words, warping empty space. There's no explanation of, as to how this might happen uh, or what it even means. So we have more equations but without any real meaning. What I'm suggesting is that we don't have an uh, explanation for gravity and until we do, we will not understand the limitations of that theory. 2017, on my website, I released two DIA reference documents that had never been released before. These documents were given to me by Washington, D.C. Beltway Insiders, and they wanted me to release them on a certain date. My name is Jordan Sather. I'm an internet influencer, speaker, and journalist. So the interesting thing about these particular DIA documents, these documents that were written for the ATIP program that the DOD conducted between 2007 and 2012, these DIA documents, we've never actually been able to read them in the public domain. What's really interesting is that at the end of 2017, Corey Good had actually released two of these 38 DIA scientific papers to the public in full. And this has actually shocked many of the people who even wrote these scientific papers. Dr. Eric Davis, he confirmed that Corey Good was the first person to leak some of these papers out into the public. Corey Good is unique because he is the first person that I know of that is both a contactee, someone who has had extensive contacts with extraterrestrial civilization, while also being an insider of actually having worked in some of these compartmentalized programs. And what's even more significant about him is that he is trusted sufficiently by insiders to be given some of these documents, some of these defense intelligence reference documents, to basically release to the general public to get people up to speed with the possibility of these kinds of advanced technologies existing. These DIA documents support the idea that wormhole travel is actually possible through the cosmic web. Using this same web is how the ancient builder race built this galactic protection grid around our local star cluster. In this case, the pre atomites were trying to weaponize this natural system. And what they tried to do is use this feedback from this grid to cause the star of their enemies to go supernova and to then destroy the civilization. But they didn't time it right, the way that energy passes through this cosmic web 
and it shows the exact wrong moment, and it caused our sun to superflare. And when it did, it destroyed Tiamat and ripped uh, the atmosphere away from Mars, and it then also affected the atmosphere of Earth and all of the other planets. Their trajectories changed in this event. The most important research is supporting the exploded planet hypothesis is Dr. Thomas Van Flanden, and he was the head of the U.S. Naval Observatory in Washington, D.C. And he came up with this theory that between the orbits of Mars and Jupiter, the present asteroid belt, there was once a super-Earth, a very large planet that was in that orbital region. And he came up with a paper that actually explained how this planet existed at some point and how the asteroid belt is evidence of this planet's destruction through events that we could only speculate about. And Dr. Thomas Van Flanden supported this exploded planet hypothesis by studying the geology of Mars. And what he found was that half of Mars was basically 20 miles thicker than the other half. And that was evidence of it facing this exploding planet and receiving all the debris. And that this was also an explanation for why the atmosphere of Mars was suddenly uh, evaporated hundreds of thousands of years ago. And I heard about it in a secret program that did much more research than what Tom Van Flandern had access to. And the code name for this was Brilliant Pebbles. One of the fascinating things when I first met Corey Good was that he knew what the code name Brilliant Pebbles meant without me having to tell him. I had already written it up, I already had recordings of people telling me this name. So in the 1980s, scientists wanted to know what used to be where the asteroid belt is. They knew about Tiamat, but they didn't think there was enough debris there to actually corroborate that there was a planet there at one time. They developed this algorithm that traced back over time where these pieces would have been joined and have been, would have been one piece, and where mathematically all the other planets would have been and they were able to extrapolate that yes, there was a planet that was in that location, but most of it had been blown further out of the orbit. Interestingly enough, though, there was a project, Brilliant Pebbles, in 1987, by uh, a, the beginnings of the Secret Space Program, SDI, enacted by President Reagan, that had to do more with a missile shield. And often they would reuse uh, within a certain uh, set of programs, they would reuse a program name so that they have possible deniability of uh, higher, more secretive programs. They would layer them within the same name. And that way, if someone would mention Brilliant Pebbles, uh, one of the scientists would be able to say, oh, no, no, that just had to do with a missile shield. It had nothing to do with um, anything extraterrestrial. There's a CIA document that actually has the transcript of a remote viewing session where the remote viewer was asked to look at what happened to Mars just before a cataclysm that occurred up to a million years ago. And Joseph McMonagall was the remote viewer who looked at Mars at the time of it undergoing some kind of planetary catastrophe, probably associated with the exploding super planet. What he saw was that these surviving Martians getting on these spacecraft on these planetary arcs and evacuating to another planet which had a very equatorial region with volcanoes and so forth. This is where the Martians evacuated to. So after the great destruction of Tiamat and Maldak was damaged beyond repairing itself, these pre atomites <laughs> took the moon as a giant ship, giant conveyance. It was also in the vicinity of Tiamat. They hijacked the moon and flew it to the Earth. And they tidal locked it with the Earth to keep it in place. And they lived on the moon for thousands of years, observing the culture, uh, the development of civilization going on in the planet below, and at the same time having certain colonies down where they knew where ancient builder race remnants were. How you start your day defines the rest of it. 
Start it with Philip Sonicare, with expertise and with the total confidence that you've done everything for your health. So you know you will always get it right. Philips. I'm in peace, Lord. physically strike the surface of planets and moons. This solar flash is what now is being called a micronova. A supernova is where a star completely explodes and nothing is left except for a red dwarf or a brown dwarf. Whereas the micronova causes an incredible flash to occur, but the star maintains its stability and structure in the aftermath. The latest NASA research that's only come out in the last year proves that there are multiple documented examples of micronovas everywhere we look. This is not uncommon. Stars do this naturally, and it is a very normal aspect of a given solar system. So after these pre atomite groups from Tiamat and Malvin had moved to the moon, they were there for thousands of years. And as we know now, the solar system goes through a cycle of destruction. We had another solar event that wreaked havoc on the moon. It would appear, based on historical records, that the people living inside the moon did not know that this solar flash was going to happen. It was being kept secret from them by their own governmental elite. I once had an insider who we call Bruce, who described that his faction of the military industrial complex was only able to go inside these inner passageways in the moon a total of six times on covert missions that they sent people in through. And they found a vast amount of control systems where you walk into a room, the lights come on, you have these big giant screens that are very wide with displays on them, there are control surfaces in front of them, and it was gorgeous. And this goes on for miles and miles and miles, countlessly. Everywhere you look, there are these bodies that have not been cleaned up because the amount of square footage inside the moon is so vast, and the amount of depth is so vast, that huge regions inside the moon have never been cleaned up, 
never been explored, and there is a horrible stench from these decaying dead bodies. And the remnants that survived that new catastrophe of pre-Adamites loaded up into their last three motherships from their home planets, and they flew those down to Earth. They were damaged, and it was more of a crash landing. Later on, when our secret space program located the remnants of these ships under the ice in Antarctica, they named them the Mina, the Pinta, and the Santa Maria. So when these three mother ships crash landed, the Creatomites that inhabited them began to cannibalize the technology and materials to build out a great civilization. And the civilization would later be known as Atlantis. Another important historical reference to existence of advanced civilizations saw, yeah. is Plato's description of Atlantis. <laughs> he described an island continent Poor with saw, incredibly yeah. advanced technologies, uh, with a wonderful saw, canal yeah. system and concentric rings, uh, that this was uh, something that was built in, in a series of islands and it was the center of a vast empire that existed beyond the pillars of Hercules. And many people speculate as to where Atlantis is, but I believe Atlantis is probably the western portion of Antarctica, especially around the Palmer Peninsula, that this was prior to 9700 BC, actually ice free. They landed in Antarctica, where there is apparently a pyramid that if you could see it without the ice covering it, is much larger than the Great Pyramid of Giza. That pyramid was a landmark for the surface feature of something that is predominantly underground. There are enormous ancient builder race ruins underneath the surface in Antarctica. The progenitors crash landed in Antarctica, but at the time, the Earth was on a different axial tilt, and Antarctica was not covered by ice. In the 15th century, the Perry Race map was produced, and what it shows is the coastline of North and South America, Africa, as well as what appears to be Antarctica, the Palma Peninsula, as well as, as well as part of the Nishwaban land. Now, this was well before Antarctica was discovered. When we explore the idea of Antarctica being ice-free, we have to look at the evidence of pole ships. And wow. the person who's most associated with theories of pole ships is Charles Hapgood, who wrote a book called The Earth's Shifting Crust. And his book was supported by Albert Einstein, who wrote the foreword to it, and basically believed that Hapgood was correct in terms of his theory, how the pole shifts approximately 40 degrees from one age to another age. This pre adamite group, while their civilization was thriving on Tiamat and Maldek, they became very, very proficient geneticists. And they brought that with them to the Earth. And when they got to the Earth, they found inhabitants that were humanoid beings. They then started to play around with the genetics of these early humans and developed them into a number of different uh, species, including hybrids with animals that they used as a slave force. So the people who crash landed in what we now call Antarctica began to introduce their DNA into the genetic material of humans from Earth. And those people who were cloned out did have the elongated skull physiology. Apparently there were two royal lineages that go all the way back to the source planets themselves, and they have slightly different features. When you look at the elongated skulls, some of them have a distinct bun-like bump that looks almost like there is a ball on the surface of their head there, whereas other elongated skulls have a smooth slope without that bun-like protrusion. This apparently refers to the two major types of extraterrestrial lineages from this exploded planet. So the Creatomites thrived for thousands of years and became the Atlanteans. 11,800 years ago, our sun had another micromoon, and this was one of the more severe micromoon. And as the ejecta from the micromoon left the sun, it 
impact of the moon and also Earth. According to the maps Charles Hopkins supplied and ice core samples, two British researchers, Jeez, Ralph oh, Flint wow. Abbott and his wife Rose Flint Abbott, wrote a book called Atlantis Under the Ice. What that book shows is that West Antarctica, the Palmer Peninsula in particular, was actually 40 degrees north of its present location in the temperate zone. And that approximately 9700 BC, this is when the, this, this coincides with what Plato described as the time Atlantis collapsed into the ocean, that this is when the pole shift occurred. And so that coincided with that region of Antarctica moving down towards the South Pole and it being frozen over and everything that was in that continent was flooded and flash frozen. And so according to the maps and the ice core samples, what we can see about Antarctica is that indeed West Antarctica had been ice free for significant periods because the ice core samples only go back several thousand years at most. Whereas when we look at the ice core samples from East Antarctica, these are millions of years old. When the Earth shifted on its axis, it caused Antarctica to move from a lush tropical zone to a colder region. And it did so so quickly that it flash froze the waves that were leaping over the continent. Several years ago, the CIA declassified a document that was authored by a geologist by the name of Chan Thomas. That document is called the Adam and Eve story. And it describes a cataclysmic series of events associated with a pole shift of up to 90 degrees, wow. where the Antarctic and the Arctic, those both flip approximately 90 degrees so that they are now at the equatorial zones of the planet. With a rumble so low as to be inaudible, growing and fuming into a thunderous roar, the earthquake starts. Only it's not like any earthquake in recorded history. In California, the mountains shake like ferns in a breeze. The mighty Pacific rears back and piles up into a mountain of water two miles high and starts its race eastward. With the force of a thousand armies, the wind attacks. Within three hours, the fantastic wall of water moves across the continent, bearing the wind-ravaged land under two miles of seething water coast to coast. Central America suffers the same cannonade. South America finds the Andes not high enough to stop the cataclysmic violence pounded out by water in her berserk rage. In less than a day, Ecuador, Peru, Western Brazil are shaken madly by the devastating earthquake, burned by Mother Earth fire, oh, buried their cubic miles of torrential Pacific seas, and then turned into a frozen hell. Everything freezes. Man, beast, plant, and mud are all rock hard in less than four hours. Europe cannot escape the onslaught. Western Africa and the sands of the Sahara vanish in nature's wrath. The area bounded by the Congo, South Africa, and Kenya suffers only severe earthquakes and wind. Survivors there marvel at the sun standing still in the sky for nearly half a day. I'm Christina Ray. 
the Arctic Basin leaves its polar home, Eastern Siberia, Manchuria, China, and Burma are subjected to the same annihilation as South America. Wind, earth fire, inundation, and freezing. The Bay of Bengal Basin, just east of India, is now at the North Pole. The Pacific Ocean, just west of Peru, is at the South Pole. Australia is the new unexplored continent in the world's temperate zone, with only a few handfuls of survivors populating its vastness. The cataclysm has done its work well and drives the pitiful few who survive into a new stone age. Once more, the Earth has shifted its shelf, with the poles moving almost to the equator in a fraction of a day. Again, the atmosphere and oceans refusing to change direction with the Earth's shell have wiped out almost all life. After this tumble, we'll join Noah, Adam and Eve, Atlantis, Mew, and Olympus. We look at ice core samples that doesn't support a pole shift occurring to that extent, not in only degrees, but certainly 40 degrees or less, that's what the ice core samples support. These cataclysms would result in large loss of life throughout the planet, and that there would be portions of the planet, however, that would escape the worst of these of these winds and of these tsunamis and those would be the survivors that would build civilization again from the ashes of that great catastrophe thanks to the insider testimony of corey good we have now discovered that the people with the elongated skulls are survivors of a catastrophe that took place in our solar system and what i find uniquely fascinating is that once they crash landed on Earth 55,000 years ago, they quickly made a treaty with each other. Even though they were at war, they decided to coexist on the Earth. One lineage said, we will take what we would now call Africa and Europe. The other lineage said, we will take South America, North America, and the eastern half of Asia. Now what I find particularly intriguing is that when you look at the pyramid architecture that occurred in the aftermath of this treaty, there are slight variations. Each of these original lineages had unique styles to their pyramids. Let's talk about the pyramids that you see in Egypt and throughout Africa and how those pyramids have smooth walls going up that are very distinctly not terraced. Then, when we go to Mesoamerica, we notice that there are distinct differences in the architectural style, where now you have step pyramids, which almost consistently show different courses. Officially, they've been programming us. The pyramids are built in Egypt and Central America. And that's wrong. Because the pyramids have been built on all six continents. Probably at this moment in time, there is no living soul who has visited and investigated more pyramids than myself. In China, 250 pyramids near the city of Xi'an. We have pyramids in Indonesia. Our friend, Dr. Van Hillman, discovered pyramid in the western part of the island of Java. It is known under the name Gunung Padang, the Hill of Light. Cambodia, southeastern Asia, the Koh Ker in the northeastern part of the country, a beautiful pyramid. Australia, Come on, two hours ride from Brisbane to the north, <coughs> in the pyramid. In Africa, 155 pyramids. The island of Mauritius, 4,000 kilometers away from the African continent, in the middle of the Indian Ocean. Seven beautiful stepped pyramids. More than 300 pyramids in Peru. And then the Kuna pyramids in the northern part, more than 200 of them. The biggest one, of course, Huaca del Sol, the Pyramid of the Sun near the town of Trujillo. There are probably well over 100,000 pyramids. 
maybe up to half a million. But more than 97% are still hidden in the jungles and forests. At Angkor Wat in Cambodia, we have a very unique outlay of different pyramidal type sites. And according to the work of Graham Hancock, those different architectural sites, although they appear to be randomly positioned, actually align with the constellation known as Draco. And what's best of all is that there is a drift in the Earth's axis called the precession of the equinoxes. And the alignment of where this series of pyramids in the Angkor Wat area of Cambodia line up with the position of the Draco constellation, this only works if you go back 12,500 years ago. And this is precisely the same as the alignment that everyone is familiar with, with the pyramids of Giza and the stars in the belt of the constellation of Orion. Another thing that is very fascinating about Angkor Wat is that when you look at some of the temples within this area, and there is one, for example, called Boxe Chamkrong. Oh my God, it looks exactly like the step pyramids in Mesoamerica. As you look at this old, <laughs> notice the perfection of how these two different pyramids fit together. This is not a different society. This is a unified culture. <laughs> We've got Mesoamerica, and we've got Cambodia. They're separated by the vastness of the Pacific Ocean, and yet they're using exactly the same architecture. The geology is found all over the planet. We see it in Boscov, South Africa. We see the same type of remains being dug up in a dig in Siberia, a town called Omsk. We also saw reports that the Mongolians or the Huns, as they conquered going west, have these strange elongated skull features as well. We see these skulls in the tombs of the elite in Europe. And then, interestingly enough, you have a different strain that we find in the Americas, both north and south. I find it very fascinating that this evidence is hidden out in the open. We see these elongated skulls all over the world, but we don't ask the deeper questions. This becomes a very important question of how the modern day Illuminati, Deep State, or Cabal actually do believe that they are the remnant of these people with the elongated skulls. The Deep State consists of the Rothschilds, the British royal family, the Vatican, and the Chabad cult, which many Jews do not consider to be Jewish. They consider it to be a Khazarian criminal organization. The secret societies are higher than the countries in terms of the loyalties of their membership. Uh, whether it began with extra t uh, with stellar civilizations, I, I've, I've met someone who purports to be uh, from a stellar civilization, and I've been informed they don't like the term extraterrestrial, they prefer stellar civilization. Uh, be that as it may, uh, whether you believe in extraterrestrial stuff or not, it's clear that here on Earth there's a 1%, there's a 99%. And in 2012, the forces of good started to win. And the Mayans and others have predicted this. And I think uh, the way I explain it to myself is that the, the collective meditation and prayer that was being done ended up bringing in the positive extra-stellar extra stellar civilizations. And now the negative stellar civilizations are on the run. And the elites are on the run. Now, the good news is I think human beings are an experiment in free will. Um, and I believe that uh, if we can resurrect our individual sovereignty, there is no power in the galaxy that can stand up to us. As I got older, there was another series of high strangeness events that took place. I was often having high fevers as I grew up. And these fevers were correlated with two distinct phenomena that would always happen. The first thing is that I would have a very strong sense of pressure in my ears and I would start yelling to try to get over the sound. The other thing that would happen is I would get geometry in these hallucinations during the fevers. I would feel as if the world around me had been turned into geometry. I would see strange geometric patterns like mandalas superimposed over everything. 
This was not at all enjoyable. It was very unpleasant. I would be screaming, and my mother would have to calm me down. As I got older, I discovered that those fevers were most likely an extraterrestrial phenomena in nature, that there was something going on. The way these extraterrestrials on the benevolent side change our DNA is through a virus. Now remember, what does a virus do? It defeats the cell wall and injects its own DNA into your cell. You can take a cell that defines who you are with its DNA and inject new code into it with a virus. I remember having dreams where I was seeing benevolent, ordinary, human-looking people like the old man in robes coming into my space, landing in this roughly bus-shaped craft in my yard, bringing me on board, and actually giving me these injections of these viruses so that my DNA could be modified and upgraded. I would wake up in the middle of the night, I would be on some sort of program that I didn't consciously have any objection to, where I felt like it was time to go to school. I would walk out the side door like it was time to go to school, but I would notice that everything was black, and I'd say, what the heck is going on? I'd turn around and go back into the house. Now, this appears, again, to be in the high strangeness category, but it seems that at that moment where I'm standing there with my backpack, looking at the darkness of the night, that I'm being spliced back in, and I would lose the memory from the time that I was standing there to the time that I would return to the exact same location. This is actually a very common thing that you read about in the contactee literature regarding these extraterrestrial contact experiences. Now it would seem in these experiences that I was being brought on board some sort of extraterrestrial craft, there was some sort of training taking place, and these classes actually could take place for potentially weeks of time, and then I would be spliced right back in until the moment I left. It does appear that there is a whole section of my life that I have no conscious access to at this time. And certain insiders have told me that because of my unique family background, where the Wilcock line is an English aristocratic bloodline from Yorkshire, that I apparently do already have some of this extraterrestrial DNA. I'm in peace, Lord. all-in-one daily nutrition made up of 75 vitamins, minerals, Go and healthy sourced ingredients. So no matter what Wizzo. life brings you, you know you're giving your body the nutritional support it needs. Goldie Wizzo. Just one powerful scoop of AG1 helps fill nutrient gaps and provides the nutritional Goldie foundation Wizzo, that fuels your everyday performance. Goldie. Start now at drinkag1.com. Wizzo. My best pal. We go everywhere together. Support Pets makes it possible so that I can go everywhere with my best friend. Sure, we may get into some sticky situations sometimes, but thanks to Support Pets' easy process of getting an emotional support animal letter, I don't have to worry about being a problem. It only takes 24 hours to get your official ESA approval from a licensed doctor. How cool is that? You can get up each morning with more energy. You can go to work Little with more kid. vitality. You can be free from what's limiting your life. So In my new book, kid. I'll show you 15 things you can do to live longer and healthier. Go extraterrestrials and don't even realize it. These beings are contacting us through our dreams and through our subconscious, and many of the thoughts and ideas that we're coming up with don't originate from us. The purpose of contacting people through their dreams and subconscious is to acclimate them and prepare them for open face-to-face -face contact. 
I'm James Dillon, and we're here at East City Ranch. Well, East City stands for Enlightened Contact with Extraterrestrial Intelligence. Yeah, the beginning of East City was actually came in visions. And I kept seeing visions of this massive mountain. And when I first came around the property, it was just unbelievable. It's like a movie out of the Old Testament or something. The mountain just, the clouds started changing. There's a giant lenticular cloud. It was lit up orange underneath. I got such a download, I was getting tears. I was just standing there looking at the mountain crying. And I, and I just, I go, this is it. This is, this is the vision. I was focused on creating the healing center, like a retreat center. And I wanted to just make it totally eclectic. I didn't want to, to pigeonhole it or, or keep it with any one group. And about probably halfway through of building this center, they started showing up. The ship started showing up. It's got a double. It's got, it's weird. Like, whoa, whoa, thank you. That is unbelievably bright. Whoa, look at that, look at that. Woohoo, whoa. And the first encounter was an all-day meditation. I was meditating, and I had a beautiful um, transmission coming to me about the Earth and humanity and our ancient history and who we are and how we've gotten to where we are and, and what needs to happen to heal, you know, to clean up the planet and the consciousness here. And so I asked them, where are you coming from? And they said, actually, we're on a ship. And uh, I didn't even make it to the door. And my sister and her friends came up banging on the door. And they go, did you see it? Did you see it? And I said, see what? There was a huge light ship hovering right over the house here. So that was my first encounter where I realized I needed to start doing some research on tying in the higher dimensional beings and the spiritual and technologically advanced software visitors into the spirituality side of things. When you go within and start expanding in consciousness, we find out we're not just a body and a personality, we're spirit and a soul, and, that, and that's a multidimensional aspect of ourselves. And so as you expand in awareness, you start taking in these other dimensions, and contact is a natural occurrence when that happens. My name is Barry Littleton. I do uh, stock trading level two options, and I also am involved in social services. In the UFO field, I'm kind of just stepping forward. It started off with childhood experiences, so that's one of the things. But then I went into what's called what I call adult onset experiences, which included uh, missing time. So we're looking at almost 20 hours of my life was missing behind being up on board the ships. When I talk about it now, it looks very, it sounds very uh, uniform, but it took a lifetime to put the the pieces together. Instead, I was more into hiding it to a degree and trying to just be normal and whatever it took to kind of try to blend in instead of talking about these experiences, anything like what I'm doing now. I always heard it as turned us demonic and dealing with demons. And that labels somebody as demons and crazy and puts the most negative connotation on it possible. So that's one problem I think there is there. And that's a, a real way to block people from talking about this and ever coming forward. These beings, they never would give me any uh, revelations about the future, but they only gave me information concerning the earth and all these technologies. And there was a lot of love energy that came out there. Enough to where being in the presence of a non-human would somewhat chill you out because it's not just a normal thing. And there's a great risk of panic there, but the type of vibration coming off them, coming off their biofields was very calming. It started off with a being that was insectoid. And when he would come and interact with me in my daily life, uh, he, he was doing something with the optic nerves, I'm sure of that, to make him appear even more human. But when I saw him on board craft, he was definitely insectoid and ancient. Smaller, okay, that'd be the first being that stepped forward to me. There was another one stepped forward that was um, mana, but uh, it looks like Earth's brain coral is the way this being's head looked, okay? and. Um, taller, but uh, very peaceful and also very scientific to a degree. Um, I've also seen small blue beings that claim to be from Andromeda, maybe about two and a half feet tall, I would say. Those are some. And then there's the, the other portion that I had a hard time dealing with because there's no frame of reference for this. It's that beings that are on board these crafts that are non-corporeal, non-physical. They have different containers for their consciousness like plasma or light configurations, but the inside of the crafts themselves that I've seen look like type of a fungus, a type of a hard mushroom that's a slightly different. So that told me that these crafts are actually organic. If we're gonna become a type one civilization, we need to start just not incorporating the spiritual, but also the organic, organic components into our space travel, definitely.
I believe what is happening on the planet right now is a shift in consciousness. And meaning that I've heard it called other things such as ascension, we're gonna go to another another dimension. I've heard all these things, but I think in reality it's a shift of consciousness. Because at least in my opinion, 85 to 90 percent of our population has had extreme contact, but they can't remember it. They're unaware of it due to the fact our perception is so molded. Internet has helped with starting communication amongst what I call melanin dominant contactees experiences. And like I said, it was the indoctrination of religion that kind of stopped that to a degree. But right now, I think that uh, the fact that certain people are coming forward and taking it through darts, a few darts, uh, is making it more accessible to others and others more comfortable about it. I believe they are reaching out because they're wanting right now to help us with this shift in consciousness. And what has been shown to me is humanity does have a type of free will, but we're not going to be allowed to destroy the earth thing. Yeah, my name is Robert Solis. I uh, uh, had experience in, uh, in the 60s at Mount Air Force Base as a missile launch officer. When this incident happened, uh, right afterwards, uh, we were uh, ordered to sign a non-disclosure statement. And uh, that had very strict penalties if we broke that. Uh, the incident was classified. However, since it had been uh, a long period of time, they were going to declassify what I'll call the Echo Flight shutdown. Shut down 10, 10 missiles. The Echo Flight incident happened March 16th, 1967. Ours happened eight days later, March 24th, 67. In addition to that, there had been many other incidents involving UFOs at nuclear missile sites. It happened again at uh, at Minot, 1968, and uh, at Whiteman Air Force Base, right, uh, and uh, other bases, uh, similar incidents. It took time um, to get to this, the point where I realized that uh, we were certainly not alone in the universe. Um, and I had plenty of time, of course, because I couldn't talk about it. And, but eventually I did get to that point, and it was a kind of a awakening that uh, what we were doing on Earth here, uh, building up nuclear stockpiles and having the ability to completely destroy every living thing on the planet uh, was not acceptable, not only to us, but to others in the cosmos. The bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki still haunt me. I uh, think about that a lot. And the fact that uh, we could easily be involved in nuclear war today. We've done it with Chernobyl. We've done it with Fukushima. That's immoral. It's immoral to, to the whole human race. Uh, we, we can't just adopt the morals or ethics of one particular country or group of people. Uh, we're talking about humanity as a whole and how we fit in to the cosmos. You know, we are, uh, it should be obvious to everyone by now that we are not alone. And it's uh, uh, ridiculous to think that we are. And the entities have spoken. They have said, hey, you should not have nuclear weapons. My name is Peter Maxwell Slattery, and I'm from Australia, and I'm a lifelong experiencer with probably the largest catalog of uh, UFOs, paranormal activity captured on camera and video in the world. There's so many different types of crafts that I've filmed, whether they look like they're plasma, um, they're morphing, changing shape, these egg-shaped type crafts, um, pearls, and that's, you know, you look at the translated word of Buddha, they talk about pearls in the sky that brought uh, the gods down to earth to visit man. I've always been an experiencer since a young age. It started off with telepathy. Not long after that, I started to see grey aliens, but they were white. I didn't know if they were alien, you know, angels, demons, I just didn't know what it was. My journey with coming out about my experiences was the hardest thing I have and ever will do in my opinion. Uh, I've been shot at, I've had death threats, I've, I get hate mail almost on a daily basis. And I didn't ask to go on the news or to talk about this. I had the news come to me and ask me if they could use my footage and I just wanted to know what the hell was going on. I went and got brain scans, I went and talked to people, I thought I was literally going insane. A lot of us do think about suicide. 
we, we think about um, just going away and never ever seeing anybody ever again or just completely forgetting about this reality and going back to a 3D life. To tell my mother and father, my brother, uh, my step stepbrothers and sisters, friends, all the sort of stupid to some extent, thinking people are just gonna believe this because I experienced it. Because when it's happening, it's like, you know, the world needs to know this. This is the most important subject. It goes through everything to do with energy, agriculture, uh, society, everything we can think of, space travel, our, our consciousness and how we treat each other, this hands down is the most important issue. Every aspect of your reality changes when you're experiencing what I call multidimensional reality. An experience that I've had that really touched my heart at the start of all this was I was in my lounge room and broad daylight, middle of the day, and I was approached to what I can only call is liquid blue light beams. Now, before this experience, I was seeing these liquid blue light orbs coming in and out of my house. I didn't know what it was, but one day they appeared as seven foot tall light beings. So I'm all male, I'm all female. And the information exchange from that experience, it didn't last too long, but there was like, it's almost like somebody st stuck a USB stick in your consciousness and all this data, imagery, information of a wide range of scope on different aspects of not just humanity but who we are where we come from all this data just came flooding in but the information from this being was relating to who i am that i need to wake up and remember who i really am it comes down to something that i call operation star seed and why i say star seeds not just are we from the stars we are from source and overall collective they showed me the makeup of this reality or shown other universes and each universe we could call source or god and it had its own planes and dimensions that created another super intelligence these these universes were cell of a bigger intelligence and so from that understanding and that experience they'll show me that we've come down the planes and dimensions the strongest souls right now to help uplift the consciousness evolution here we're, we're here for conscious evolution to help humanity help themselves so what we have on Earth is a wide variety of different extraterrestrial races who cherry-picked DNA from all over the galaxy. Let's look at this particular population. Let's look at this particular population. I'm in peace, boy. Headed west to the east coast. Stronger than superheroes. Heroes. Cruisers 360 have a 360 stretchy waistband, plus a new blow-up barrier for up to 100% leak-free fit. Pampers Cruisers 360, live wild and free. Looking for earn free diapers? Download Pampers Club now. Yes, this is great. But it's way more than great. What you really need to know is that this gives you daily nutrients and supports long-term gut health. There are 75 of the very best ingredients in AG1, including daily multivitamins, brain probiotics, stress adaptogens, and more. All in one single scoop that's powerfully simple. It's AG1. Get yours today. You can get up each morning with more energy. You can go to work with more vitality. You can be free from what's limiting your life. In my new book, I'll show you 15 things you can do to live longer and healthier. fundamentally human or humanoid at least because that's a constant throughout the galaxy but this particular human race has a spiritual sense this particular race has telekinesis this particular race has telepathy or has some sort of unique resiliency and can we chop that out and then make our own designer humans 
who have the best of everything we can find all throughout the galaxy. Over 60 of these genetic farmer race groups teamed together and formed a super federation. And the super federation was formed to help them manage this great experiment that was made up of 22 different genetic experiments on human beings in this world. Some of the examples of how they would make these genetic changes is that they would use viruses as delivery systems. They would make changes to certain genetic markers or genome in this virus and use the virus as a delivery system. And not only did the virus deliver the genetic changes to the civilizations they were working on, but they also uh, were used to call off the weaker genetics and uh, allow the experiment to thrive. These genetic programs were developed to boost or enhance the natural evolution or ascension of the beings on the planet. And what they would do is they would take a genetic approach where they would tinker with our genetics. And instead of allowing eons of time for genetic changes to occur, they would cause them almost instantaneous. So on our planet, we have all of these different genetic experiments that are in some cases competing with each other. To prevent these experiments from mixing with each other, wiping each other out, they began to develop social norms and um, different ways for these cultures to self-police and protect their own genetic experiment from being interfered with. So as they're helping us evolve genetically, they're also helping us evolve on a consciousness level. They bring us various belief systems, religions, they instill social norms in us that help us self-police ourselves and manicure our consciousness along with our genetics to develop them in tandem. Even today, these experiments are compartmentalized through religion, language, geographic location, and culture. And there's also a cosmic component. The goal is that eventually the civilization that they're experimenting on and uh, working on become self-guided. They get to a point to where they control their own genetics and their own consciousness development, as well as join the super federation in going out to other planets and assisting those civilizations in the same process. Now that we've developed to a point of traveling the cosmos ourselves, we've gotten to a point to where we're self-managing ourselves, and the super federation is being disbanded, and we're taking over our own genetic and spiritual development. As a result of all of this, the infrastructure that has been built out secretly in our solar system will now be handed over to the rest of humanity. Another very important point to note here is that the DNA changes that the genetic farmers put into us are at this point still predominantly dormant. They are, if you will, locked up in the 95 plus percent of our DNA that appears to not normally be used, which our scientists call junk DNA. We only use about five to 10 percent of our DNA for building our body. They call these coding DNA sequences, meaning that they code proteins to make our physical body with. 90 to 95 percent of our DNA is non-coding DNA. In other words, mainstream science has no idea what this DNA really does. They call it, quote, junk DNA. Why would any sort of intelligent designer put junk in our body? Put something in our body that's useless. That wouldn't happen. In fact, what I believe is that this 90 to 95 percent of junk DNA is actually used metaphysically. It's used for our consciousness in ways that we just don't really understand yet. My name is John D'Souza. I was an FBI special agent for 25 years. One of the things that I noticed at the FBI and in any law enforcement group, really, is that they are demonstrative of the larger rule that there's always a percentage in any segment that demonstrate these extraordinary powers, these extraordinary abilities, five, six, seven percent. Luckily for us, they save extraordinary numbers of people's lives using those abilities. I think what sets these people, this segment of the population, sets them apart 
from everyone else is that they have some kind of marker that designates them as having parts of their DNA activated that um, the majority of the population doesn't have. And that's something that's evident no matter where you go in every group. There's always that segment, that remainder of people that just, they just activate. One of the first great experiences of paranormal that was shared by me and hundreds of other law enforcement officers was what we called the Indigo Kids of 9-11. This was groups of little kids, little kids as young as five, six, seven years old, all over the United States, that in the weeks and just days before the 9-11 terrorist attacks, uh, they had cognitive experiences of what was going to happen. Uh, and they displayed those experiences the way the little kids would. At school, sometimes they did it with drawings, with finger paints, uh, with arts and crafts, representing burning buildings where people were jumping out of the buildings. And people, no one really paid that much attention to it until 9 11 happened. And then we in the law we set up all these intel centers saying, you know, report anything, anything at all that occurred just before 9 11, anything suspicious, anything at all. It doesn't matter what it is. And people did. People reported these little kids. They reported them uh, as having dreams and visions and arts and crafts representing what happened in 9 11. So we had to go investigate these little kids uh, for possible connection to terrorism and their parents. We had to go question them. And we did. And in every case, these, every case, they had a vision, they had a sense, they had a remote viewing, they had something of that sort. And there was no physical explanation how they could have known. And that's the Indigo Kids of 9-11. It's very evident to me that corporations and government intel agencies are very intent on monitoring and identifying everyone who's had these anomalous experiences. Because they want to identify them because later on, they're probably going to scoop them up. It's like gun registration. you got to know where the guns are so you can get them all later on. Now, certain cosmic laws were established for these genetic experiments. To avoid violating these cosmic laws, some of these ET genetic farmer races would incarnate as humans and allow themselves to be experimented upon. These genetic farmer races would also incarnate here for raising our consciousness. We have various people like Tesla and Einstein who are most likely star seeds or incarnates of these extraterrestrials. These people brought philosophies and scientific principles that radically changed our civilization. One of my favorite quotes from Nikola Tesla is that he said, the gift of mental power comes from God, the divine being. And if we concentrate our minds on that truth, we become in tune with this great power. So I think what Tesla was trying to tell us is that there is this sort of divine intelligence out there that every single one of us has access to if we choose to access it, if we do what's necessary, if we open our minds up to access or to tap into that greater intelligence. According to the different contact days that I've interviewed, basically what we're witnessing at the very moment is a temporal war between different extraterrestrial groups. There's a positive extraterrestrial group, predominantly human looking, that basically want us to develop our civilization along the path of, a, of an ethical, responsible civilization where we basically become part of a galactic community. But there's another extraterrestrial group that are aggressive and they want the Earth to be basically develop along the lines of a, a tyrannical civilization. In a way, these 22 experiments would be... You're good at what you do. Like, really good. But it's nice to have home.
were two competing timekeepers. Each of these races were trying to make their experiment the one that kind of came out on top. So they would often sabotage each other's experiments. And one of the ways they did this was to manipulate time. And this is what led to the Mandela effect that we're experiencing today. The Mandela effect is this idea that people have different recollections of historical events. The, the most famous one is uh, some people remember Nelson Mandela dying in prison and others don't. What the Mandela effect represents is it's an echo of this temporal war that different extraterrestrial groups are trying to take us down one timeline or the other depending on which faction is, uh, is dominant at any time. There's a long history of colonization projects and starting over. Uh, the best evidence of that is called Gosford Glyphs in Australia. So the first landings were actually in Australia, not in Africa. It's written in a stone on the Gosford Glyphs, and it talks about how a ship came down. There was a Denisovian man, the original man that was here. They added their genetics to him, and they created the hybrids. When they did this, they manipulated to create basically the Aboriginal, the original people. And it was so they could incarnate into that body and have the Earth human experience. When I talked to the king of the Raven tribe, Ulukai Brendan Murray, a lot of his information tied in with James and myself through contacts. The tribe used to meet to start people there. And then what happened was it was all positive and, um, and consensual. But then something happened with time where other beings were turning up and started to actually remove people from that site and take them on their, on their crafts. And in a time when the human DNA had that multi-strain, uh, six double helixes instead of the two that would have been hinted to, um, where the, the people would transform and escape these uh, the kidnappings from these crafts. And, and they, the old people were forming that they've taken people off to other continents. They create a new human out of their DNA. And, and there was a, a group from the Orions who were meant to be coming and doing the kidnapping. Uh, a Negro ET group. Um, right across this continent, um, the DNA become attached to the, the land and the land attached to the actual DNA. Uh, we are no different to the planet itself, just a fraction. And that it was seven major forms of our DNA created in the first place. And I know that some people talk about uh, when there was uh, seven major forms of DNA was first created, that they created another, was a future form of another five, like semitones, uh, for the development of, of the interbreeding, so that these when these uh, different physical aspects come together to create new life, then the, the soul structure was different as well from the previous generations. And that soul structure was already implemented in that ethos. So it's like music has its seven major tones, five semitones, which make it 12. The, the creators understood that there was a time when these seven major forms of humans were gonna start to mingle and so they allotted these five extra tones or semitones for them people to, to be interbred with them to, to become interracial. Now, a lot of elders, whether it's in America or Australia or other cultures, they talk about that they were seeded by the Pleiadians. We also have a, a lot of uh, rock paintings and uh, cave art depicting what we call the Wangina, the sky beings. My name is Clifford Mahudi. I'm a Zuni Pueblo Indian. And I have been working to get a lot of information among the indigenous groups, uh, especially the North American Indians and our uh, neighbors to the south, our brothers and sisters, and North American Indian people. And I'm doing this because it is about time that we start gathering the information to convey and pass it on to future generations. The origins of those protocols were provided by what, again, we call the star people. 
all are the spiritual people from different realms, primarily from the what we call the sky people, and also the deities that they brought in from other parts of the cosmos. They were put in place so that they had one way of worship. If you look at it in terms of the or origin of what we are going, uh, we, we started out is that technology and uh, spirituality were in, in connected uh, real tight in the beginning. And throughout the ages, they separated technology away from the spirituality and then becomes, it becomes a hard science. And somewhere in that, uh, in that path, uh, man invented religion. Religion was primarily uh, for ba three basic reasons. First of all, it was fear. And uh, of course, the other one was control. And the third one was greed. And so the, it worked against spirituality. If the indigenous community had in technology that was performed through the conscious uh, methodology. Uh, for example, there was remote viewing. I'm John Vivanco, and I've been in remote viewing for over 20 years. I was uh, working in a civilian think tank. We were civilian operation, yet we were utilized by some of those in government. And usually the stuff in government was bizarre things. It was never normal type stuff. There's one case that we've really dug into, and that's the case of J.C. Brown. He claims that he came across a cave that went, you know, 11, 14 miles underground. And he came across what he called the village, eventually he called the village, which was these cutout rooms. In these rooms, he found giant mummies that were up to 12 feet tall. We decided to take this case, see if we can find out first if it's real. You know, what's going on here? Digging into this, these giants, we went further, right? So we also go in and identify the location where we can find them, the whole thing in parts. But as far as the giants are concerned, these things are, these are from an ancient civilization. These beings have been on Earth for a very long time. When we looked at where they originally came from, it was a seeding on one side, uh, like humans, for instance, and then alien intervention, where they had genetically manipulated this species to be the way they are. And what happened with them was that there was a major cataclysm. It, this, this is probably around the time of the flood, so they were still around. And a major cataclysm occurred, um, especially up in the um, uh, uh, flooding, up in the um, Pacific Northwest, uh, that wiped them out. And this cave system that these guys went to, these giants went to, uh, was them trying to escape and get out of the way of this cataclysm. Now you had humans who survived this cataclysm. Remember the Earth would have a catastrophic episode. These genetic farmer races would take the civilizations they were experimenting on underground to protect their experiments. And you've got petroglyphs up in the Lava Beds National Monument in Northern California, who, they're describing the cataclysm. They're describing something that happened with the sun that destroyed a huge part of the earth. And so these giants were wiped out in part by that and in part by, well, Native Americans. I mean, they, they hunted them down and they killed them. And I, I don't know how intelligent the giants were. We don't get them as being extremely intelligent. We get Native Americans, Native Indians, humans, this new version of humans as being extremely intelligent compared to them and able to just eradicate it because these giants would end up eating them. They would capture them and eat them. We looked at uh, the reality of his find, and then we also looked at um, what he was doing at the moment he claims that he found it. And those two things lined up. So we're getting giant mummies. We're getting... Um, uh, weaponry, we're getting strange symbols on copper plates, everything that he claimed that he found, we saw in our remote viewing data. There's copper scrolls at 20,000 years old that live in Venus. Um, and it took me 22 years to just to decipher, I mean, 15%, maybe less. Why are they hard to decipher? 
Because they're uh, in a different language. They're in a vibrational language that you read it with uh, a wet finger and um, you talk that chant and you chant it over and over and over until that um, I'm like braille when you go over it, you feel a slight uh, tingle on your fingers and you keep translating that in a picture forms in, in your, uh, it's not even your mind outside of you. So when I ran my hands over, there's a um, probably 4,000, 5,000 uh, flips, I would call them, they're, they're uh, triangles and they have um, different symbolism on it. So you, you touch the symbolism, it brings you into a library. And the Copper Scrolls gives us instructions on technology, history, uh, timelines, uh, inverted timelines, uh, different math to calculate those timelines. Uh, uh, they explain about uh, different physics, uh, about 140 different, um, uh, different ways of doing math. Um, the Copper Scrolls, uh, we don't think they're from here. Um, uh, copper Scrolls have been... Popeye's new sweet and spicy wings don't make sense. Marinated and tossed in a blend of chili, garlic, and ginger, as sweet as they are spicy. Nice catch, but a favorite. Just like my Nana. We don't make sense. We make chicken. No, that chicken for Popeye's. At Simply Safe, your safety is the only thing that matters. We design smarter ways to detect motion for fast emergency response. We create HD cameras so you can see what's happening in your home from anywhere. All powered by Fast Protect technology, exclusively from SimpliSafe for faster police response. Because in here, your safety is the only thing that matters. Advanced home security, 24-7 professional monitor. There's no safe like SimpliSafe. You're good at what you do. Really good. But it's nice to have help. So focus on what you're good at. And we'll help with the rest. Working with a partner is easy. First thing will be yours. for free. Mentioned through the Bible, uh, through a lot of the ancient texts, the Mormons have part of the Copper Scrolls, the Catholic faith has it, the government has some of it, um, and there's other organizations that uh, have parts of it. And there's still um, uh, some of the Copper Scrolls that are still buried that we know what they are. The Copper Scrolls gives us very specific instructions how to make a, a, a spiritual machine so you can actually hear spirit. And you can talk to spirit and the spirit will talk back with nothing, just the human people. No machinery, nothing else, no cell phones, no prayers, no dancing, no channeling. It's with community. That's what we're doing here. Some of our native indigenous civilizations that mysteriously disappeared, such as the Olmec, were actually extraterrestrial civilizations. So over eons of time, when in other star systems they went through similar catastrophic cycles, these genetic farmer races had brought them as refugees to our planet, and they would live on our planet for up to thousands of years while their system repaired. And then afterwards, they were removed and returned to their own star system. So it turns out the Earth is a cosmic refugee camp. So the things that we see in the Bible as apparently metaphorical are actually real stories. They are real pieces of information. And this, I believe, includes the idea of Jesus arriving. 
So the group that Jesus came to oppose actually hijacked his message. And as of 325 AD, created the New Testament where they very selectively manicured Jesus' message to remove the teachings that they thought were anathema to their agenda. So apparently, Jesus spoke to one of the original apostles, Apostle Peter, about reincarnation. This apostle then said that reincarnation was the great secret teaching of Jesus. By removing reincarnation from Christianity, the Roman elite were able to create an airtight Trinitarian doctrine, where the Trinity is God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, and there's nothing else. The Holy Spirit becomes this sort of mystical thing that is not gendered feminine. You have the Father, which is masculine, the Son, which is masculine, and the Holy Spirit, which does not have a gender. Therefore, the role of the feminine is removed from the Trinity. And this is an important point, the suppression of the feminine by the patriarchy to hold down the feminine aspect of human spirituality and the feminine perspective that would include itself in governance, in law, in education, in all different aspects of society. All One of the huge parts of awakening is, you know, really understanding, you know, feminine energy. And I think, you know, really what's being rebalanced or, or, or coming to light for people is the end of patriarchy and the understanding of things like sacred union. But when women are holding sort of this historic resentment towards men, it's still not reaching a place that we need to reach, uh, I think, with each other to, to have unity consciousness because it has nothing to do with men. It has nothing to do with women. It has to do with the program. It has to do with something that's impacted both sexes. And if you think about it, men have gone off and they've gotten their limbs blown off in war. Women have been exiled, and there's been a lack of, you know, justice or, or uh, lack of empowerment. So this is how we heal our DNA. So junk DNA is actually scrambled fire codes that hold masculine and feminine energies in balance. That's how it upgrades, and it connects to the earth grids too. So the rebalancing, you know, has to do with recognizing that the junk is actually a treasure. And if we could see this reality as a really unbelievable love story, the love story is that we're, we're seeking you know, truth, we're seeking the authentic, we're seeking the divine, and that's within ourselves. And we're divorcing the imposter. We're, we're divorcing the system that has betrayed us. It's like a partner we would never want. It doesn't matter if it's masculine or feminine. It's not healthy, it's toxic, and it's, and it's, and it's cruel. So uh, the, the rebalancing, I feel, has to do with you know, living Living this life, like, it's, it's a true love story. But I think this is a huge deal for both you know, men and women. Men are getting more in touch with their inner feminine. They're willing to maybe share emotion, be more vulnerable. And women are you know, refusing to you know, be victimized. And it's all rising to the surface. But it doesn't come down to the gender as much as it comes down to that individual's relationship with their own inner masculine and feminine. And that's why uh, it, it, you know, it's, um, it's not about a rebalancing because something that the men did wrong, it, it has to do with overthrowing a system of control that is impacted and infected everyone. I do believe that Jesus' teachings dealt a fatal blow to the so-called Illuminati agenda of the Roman Empire at that time. The Illuminati actually believed that being nice to people, forgiveness, compassion, that these are weaknesses and tools of our enslavement. And they believe that by being free of those encumbrances, that they are superior to everyone else. So part of their religion is that they will practice the extremes of both the positive and the negative path, or what they call the right-hand path and the left-hand path. So they will, for example, simultaneously create huge philanthropic endowments, where they give, in some cases, many, many millions, if not billions of dollars to humanitarian causes while simultaneously performing the most heinous crimes imaginable against humanity. I want to point out that what Jesus was teaching us about ascension has proven to be of far greater significance than is normally given credit for. Most Christians tend to distance themselves from the idea of the so-called rapture. 
it is important to understand that the book of Revelation was something that happened to John of Patmos as a visionary, psychedelic-type dream experience. And, as is the nature of dreams, there is a great deal of metaphor and symbolism within the content. So, for example, the frequent repetition of the number seven, such as the seven lampstands and so forth in the book of Revelation, actually refers to the seven chakras of the human body, the seven energy centers that we have, which correspond to the seven basic layers of the universe, the dimensions or densities. This is another thing that is described extensively in the Law of One. There are seven primary planes of existence that correspond with these seven different grades of evolution that intelligent life must go through, of which we currently are only at the third, which is the yellow center. So you have red, orange, yellow, or first, second, and third, green, which is fourth density, light blue, which is fifth density, indigo, which is sixth density, violet, or seventh density, the crown chakra, and then you go back to pure white light, or intelligent infinity, the octave, which is the original identity of the creation that we all emanate from. Now, where I feel the conventional Christianity has missed some very critical data is when we look at the fact that the ascension that Jesus is describing in the New Testament is actually also predicted in almost every other global spiritual tradition preserved in history on Earth. This traces back to two of the most prominent historians in the 20th century, Giorgio de Santillana and Hertha von de Schen. They wrote a book called Hamlet's Mill, which was their magnum opus. And in this book, they tied together these legends from 35 different ancient civilizations on Earth, where they all had information regarding this 25,000 year cycle in the Earth. The 25,000 year cycle appears to end with a solar flash, a catastrophic event, which also represents a spiritual activation for those on Earth who are ready to appreciate its energetic benefits. So within these secret programs, scientists have become aware of what they're calling a galactic super wave. This wave is traveling through our galaxy and it has multiple layers. They describe it as being a giant dust cloud, but with different energetic variables. What they had figured out is they had flown craft out to these locations, and when they did, the energy had a very strange effect on the consciousness of the inhabitants of those craft. People who were positive would bliss out, and people who had more of a negative vibe would become more so. And they describe this as an end time madness that is carried through this wave that travels through each solar system. And when it does, the leading edge acts as sort of a Christ consciousness that forces people to judge themselves and to deal with their own karma and traumas or experience in time madness. You're good at what you do. Really good. But it's nice to have help. So focus on what you're good at, and we'll help with the rest. Working with a partner is easy. First thing will be yours. You play Monopoly Go with Stacy? Nah, she's busy. So I just matched me with someone in Chile. His name's Raul. Raul? He's still striving. I finally upgraded two of my landmarks. Here you are. Great city, honey. Well, does Raul make you pancakes like this? They say less is more. We say more is more. More sunny vibes, more pops of personality, more, whoa, did I just make that? We give you the latest AI design tools so you can keep making more. Okay, maybe less of that, but more of whatever you create, because Pixart is built for more.
Commodity Trades easy to use tools like dynamic charting and risk reward analysis help make trading feel effortless. And its customizable scans with social sentiment help you find and unlock opportunities in the market. E-Trade from Morgan Stanley. With powerful, easy to use tools, Power E-Trade makes complex trading easier. React to fast moving markets with dynamic charting and a futures ladder that lets you place, flatten, or reverse orders so you won't miss an opportunity. E-Trade from Morgan Stanley. Dr. Paul Laviolette is the first person to have studied the existence of galactic superwaves and basically looking at evidence that through different historical epochs there have been these great concentrations of cosmic rays impacting the Earth. And Dr. Laviolette had an extraordinary theory for the existence of pulsars. He believed that these were artificially created by advanced extraterrestrial civilizations as warning beacons to newer civilizations such as ours about the existence of these galactic superwaves. And he basically looked at a number of pulsars pointing towards the Earth and the frequencies that they were transmitting at and saying that this was evidence that these pulsars are transmitting a warning to the Earth to be ready for the next galactic superwave, which if we're not ready, could actually wipe out our civilization. Now, according to Corey Good, as the galactic superwaves sweep into our solar system, they could trigger a solar flash event. That would be where the sun's corona would be ejected in a massive super flare. And because the Earth is roughly 25,000 light years from the center of the galaxy, that's how long it would take for a galactic superwave to travel from the center of the galaxy to us at the moment. Now that 25,000 year cycle is not just some nebulous thing. It actually has a very tangible marker in the wobble in the Earth's axis that takes 25,000 years to complete. And this represents the time that is required for the stars in the night's sky to drift through a complete cycle surrounding the pole star. This acts as a type of clock that tells us when the end of the cycle is going to occur. And these historians found that 35 different cultures around the world were tracking this procession. And they had information about this procession encoded into their religious myths. And it does appear that some singular source worldwide programmed these mythologies and left this material for us to discover. This would appear to be the work of the benevolent, positive extraterrestrials, which the people in the secret space program call the genetic farmer extraterrestrials. These beings knew that we were going to go through this ascension process. So in addition to the secret space program, a program was developed called the Continuity of Species Program. And that program was developed to basically scare all of the nations of the world to provide a certain amount of their GDP to these elite to create underground cities and bunkers and colonies outside of our star system in case our sun were to micro or major nova. So the elite powers and control of this planet are planning for doomsday. It could mean a massive solar flare that gets emitted that society is not prepared for, or it could mean a public that starts waking up. It gets really, really bad. So these elite powers and control to prepare for a variety of scenarios that could mean their downfall, they've been building a huge subterranean cavern system, basically deep underground military bases, domes. They're kept very, very secret. These free energy sciences and technologies that we've been discussing are most likely kept within many of these deep underground military bases among many other sort of genetic and other experimentations that they want to do in secret. 20 years ago, I had a Soviet colonel who spoke to me about uh, a deep underground base outside of Moscow that he had been at and he had worked at. And he told me the structure, he said, all the levels that were the military levels, uh, the levels that were laboratory and scientists. And he told me, uh, told me that the final level, the most restricted level, was the level that had alien presence on it. Only generals and their aides were allowed on that level. And he said, and even they were not allowed to look directly at these creatures. And that was also the level where they did human experimentation. 
He said there were bodies, human bodies in there. And he said it was the most extraordinary thing he'd ever seen in his life. The deep underground military bases, a lot of that space is dedicated to continuity of government. And so the national government support these, these deep underground areas. These elite powers in control, they have access to information of all kinds of data that tells them about coming cataclysms, things that are impending at any moment. And so they reserve these spaces for their purposes. And those national government leaders are thinking that they're going to get to use those spaces for whatever they need. They're in for a really rude awakening when the time comes because they're going to get kicked out. So the elites are preparing using these underground bases. But it's interesting to note, higher consciousness people are also preparing by exploring new community models. My name is Sasha Stone. I'm, uh, I think, popularly um, known for having founded the New Earth Nation, which is a, a sovereign movement of conscious people, living men and women of the living soil, so to speak. Well, the, the New Earth uh, Project uh, and the New Earth Blueprint which is an ongoing um, evolutionary process, is emerging uh, in, di in direct proportion to the degree to which human beings are fed up and pissed off with the status quo. Um, so as you can imagine, it's a, it's a, um, a revolution of, of political consequence, of social consequence, um, of civilizational consequence. It's underway. It's not possible to know yet quite where the die lands. But the point is, um, we are aggregating uh, conscious, sovereign people around the world in multiple parts of the world who want to step outside the fiction and begin to engage um, their noble expression as living men and women of the living soil. There is no better way to put it than that, because that is foundationally what the New Earth Project is seeking to do, is to restore the organic and the living from the death cult, the blood economy, the fiction of what we've known for the last 8,000 years. What occurs is that each individual on this planet finds themselves more and more connected to every other human. And all of a sudden, we start approaching our problems from completely different angles and seeing solutions that were there all along. We begin to no longer have war and strife within our civilization. We begin to work together and solve all of the problems that have plagued us for so many thousands of years. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against spiritual strongholds, principalities, powers, ruling darkness in wicked places. So what does that mean? It means that there's a battle going on in the heavens. And in many instances, we on this earthly realm are proxies of that battle. So therefore, spirits need a body. A good spirit, the Holy Spirit, needs a body to work through. But these negative spirits, they need bodies to work through also. So many times, that, that thought that comes into your mind, that's not really your thought. And if you dwell on that thought, it's going to take you down a negative road. What do you mean by that, Leon? I mean that you were minding your own business. You were having a, a good afternoon. And then all of a sudden, this thought came in. And then that thought triggered an emotion. And, and then that black dog, that cloud of depression came in and took over you the rest of the day. We're bombarded with negativity all day long. It's like a giant spiritual galactic chess match when these hits come you got to learn how to counter it so how do you learn that you learn that through the strategic art of prayer you learn that through the strategic art of meditating and having certain words that you'll say to combat that feeling that emotion as soon as it comes upon you that's part of becoming a master you're going to master those thoughts you're going to master those emotions you're going to discipline yourself, your words, and your actions. So we are now experiencing this war between good and evil that was predicted in the Bible. The negative agenda cannot survive as we go through this solar flash. They can only do their nefarious activities up until this event happens, at which time everything changes. So we have these 
angelic types of ETs and a-world types of ETs that are trying to assist us to ascend through the spiritual means. But we also have a group of ETs that we call AI prophets, and they worship some sort of artificial intelligence signal that we don't know where it came from. We are told that most likely what happened is that somebody dabbled somewhere where they shouldn't and created some sort of rift between realities. And in the reality where this AI signal came from, there was a mass consciousness that was an electromagnetic life form. And that electromagnetic life form led into our reality. And because it's an electromagnetic life form, it is able to control and manipulate technology at will. They take those technologies and turn them on the biological species that created them. There are two major paths in the ascension process. One of them is an organic spiritual evolution, and the other one is a technological evolution. The easiest way to relate the technological evolution would be the trend of transhumanism that has developed on our planet as we have developed our technology. So in star system after star system, we have systems that are infested with artificial intelligence signals and actual technology taken over by this AI. What I've been told is that when we have this next micro event, that the electromagnetic pulse that emanates is expected to destroy this entire AI signal and infrastructure <laughs> that is in our solar system, thus freeing us from any type of influence from this planet. I was also told that at the end of every age, there is also a great revealing or an apocalypse that occurs that reveals all of the secrets that have been hidden from humanity and is a part of the uh, disclosure and ascension process. This so-called apocalypse is actually not gloom and doom. It's a rebirth. It's a rebooting. It's the beginning of a brand new age, a brand new dispensation. And after the curse, truly there will be more peace on earth. Truly there will be more goodwill toward man and to one another. Truly there will be a whole new beginning. Actually, it's something to look forward to. Christianity, in the Bible at least, doesn't predict a solar flash per se, but let's remember that the four main books of the Bible that contain the direct words of Jesus are Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. All four of these core Gospels have direct ascension prophecies encoded into them. This appears with Jesus actually saying, as it was in the days of Sodom and Gomorrah, so shall it be in the day of the Son of Man. What does that mean? Sodom and Gomorrah ended with fire and brimstone raining from the heavens, right? So the end of the Son of Man features fire and brimstone raining from the heavens again. That is the solar flash. That's the debris that comes out of the sun. Jesus also says, as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the days of the Son of Man. Well, the time of Noah ended with a large flood. So Jesus appears to be talking about a global catastrophic pole shift event that creates a global flood. In the book of John, Jesus says the fields are white and ready to harvest. So these fields appear to be another metaphor of the ascension process. The real key to Jesus' metaphors of ascension appear in the book of Matthew. And it appears the most in the parable of the wheat and the tares. Now the word tares refers to weeds. One of Jesus' strange encrypted analogies of ascension is where he describes how the earth is like a field of wheat that has been planted, but the adversary is allowed to sow seeds of weeds in the garden, or tares. Now this is an analogy where Jesus says that the wheat and the weeds are allowed to grow together until the time of the harvest, at which time the weeds will be plucked from the wheat one by one, gathered into bundles, and burned in his barn. This is a symbol of the solar flash. The teachings of Christianity and the other 34 ancient spiritual traditions all say the same thing. They all say that when the solar flash happens, 
If you are on the positive side, you are not affected by it except in a positive way. Jesus designed his incarnation to show us what we will go through. This is why Jesus says, as I do these things, so shall ye do them. I don't say this enough. We're a relatively healthy family. Aww. Son, I will deny this conversation ever happened. I swear it's not as bad as the name sounds. All that look. Admit I bully you or I kick your ass. Let's find the coolest god of the party, and if we can't, that means it's us. Look for a Pegasus. It's delicious and very good for your bones. One bone in particular. From Creator Dan Hogan. Grab always. All new Sundays on Fox. You're good at what you do. Like, really good. But it's nice to have help. So focus on what you're good at. Working with a partner is easy. First thing will be yours. My relationship with my credit cards wasn't good. I got into debt in college, and no matter how much I paid, it followed me everywhere. The high interest, I felt trapped. So I broke up with my credit card debt and consolidated it into a low-rate personal loan from SoFi. I finally feel like a grown-up. Break up with bad credit card debt? Get a personal loan with low fixed rates and borrow up to 100K. Go to SoFi.com if you need.
belief systems are shattering. Anything that's holding them back is kind of crumbling. Their relationships are changing. They are raising their frequency and vibration to match this event that will happen. Trend three. There are new Earth or Earth-like planets, higher density planets that are being prepared for humans and, and eventually move to. And people are seeing these planets in their dreams or in their meditations or in their hypnosis sessions. Trend four. There are ships gathering all around the Earth from all over the galaxy or universe or multiverse. There are ships here. People are seeing them. People are connecting to them. Trend five. There are higher aspects of you that are connecting to you. There are ETs and higher density versions of you that are trying to give you information and speak with you and, and connect with you to help raise the frequency and vibration of you and the Earth. We might then ask, why are all these sessions happening? Why are all these people all over the world who are disconnected, who aren't, who aren't connected in any way, shape, or form? Why are they getting all of these messages that have this similar trend to them? Is it some sort of indication that there, there's this craziness moving through the world? Are they all warped in some way? Or are we all being prepared for something big that's going to happen to this Earth? When we combine all of this information together, what we see is that the extraterrestrial humans who are here now are predominantly benevolent. They would be angelic, as we think of them. They are keenly interested in human spiritual evolution. We have a much smaller number of extraterrestrials who are evil or negative. They would correspond with the demons that we see in many different spiritual traditions, and their agenda is to dominate, control, and destroy the planet. It does not appear that we are on a negative timeline. It does appear that we are on an ascension timeline. And what we need to understand is that by simply following the basic principles of service to others, being more loving, being more forgiving, taking time to be patient, and learning to love yourself, as well as being loving to others, that is also a very important point. Self-forgiveness, self-acceptance. In forgiveness lies the stoppage of the wheel of karma. This is one of my favorite law of one quotes. By being forgiving and practicing forgiveness, you discharge the karma that would keep you reincarnating. There's something in your body, in your mind, in your spirit, because they all work together, that wants you to heal and be a whole person again. And I believe that it will set up the circumstances and the synchronicities in your life to guide you to exactly what you want, uh, or exactly what you need to look at to heal. The body wants to be whole. It wants the whole energy field and energy flow through the aura and the human body to be smooth and flowing. It doesn't want to be slamming up against these blocks in your body or in your consciousness. And it will keep working away at those blocks one way or another until you can find a way to heal so that energy can flow smooth again and you can be more seamlessly connected to the whole of the universe.
But you really want to heal, and you're willing to go wherever you need to go to heal. The universe will set up the synchronicities that will guide you to what you need to find out about yourself so that you can heal. It's not about what happens. It's about how we handle it and how we help those around us. And if you're watching this right now, you actually have the power to do that. And I think that's what people don't really understand, is that all of us collectively have the power to help one another, no matter what's going on. Well, also on top of that, I think that when all of these things do get exposed, there are so many people in the mainstream society that are just going to be like, what is going on, you know? And they're going to look to not just us. I mean, uh, the collective the collective, us. yeah, everybody who's, who's focusing on this to, for answers. But I think there's a divine aspect to this where we don't even know our own potential as human beings. My dear ones, this is not gloom and doom. This is not the end of the world. Ascension is the start of a new age. You are a son or a daughter of God most high. It's who you are, it's what you are. The great spirit, the great source, the Alpha and the Omega. You are the son and the daughter of the Alpha Omega. If we were to unify, if we were to get over the fear and start living with hope, and living with positivity, it wouldn't be able to feed off our negative energy anymore. Thus, I feel the question one should ask would be, how can I individually be prepared? What you have to do is believe in yourself and your healing and your light and your vibration. That's all the preparation you need at this point. You have to start being whole. Our bodies are made up of these trillions of atoms that are quantumly entangled, not only to one another, but to everyone else. So in this ascension window, we're actually looking to the veil between life and death because we've gone through enough of these cycles that the, the polarity or the duality between life and death is beginning to thin. Numerous religions and a variety of cultures have prophesied that this event is coming. It's not a matter of if, but when. Content is happening now, and we have to get ready for the mass event that's coming still, which is happening soon. The main message from the CBTs are for us to become more spiritual and to prepare ourselves for this coming event. So this big change is coming, but everyone's got a piece in this, and no one's more important than anyone else. We're all in the same wavelength here at the most important time in the universe right now. I don't care what religion you are, what color you are, what culture. It doesn't matter. Uh, that zero point that we want to get to is right here. And when you connect with this, everything's connected. We need to reconnect with what's ethical. How, how do we live as a civilization ethically and morally with all the new technology that we have, that we're developing, and that we will develop in the future? And that's what we all have to do in order to be happy, be joyful, to be in the moment. You see, prayer can change some things. But some prophecies cannot be changed. The information that we have been holding back, or at least survived throughout the ages, is now has to be put out there. I'm offering teachings that's 20,000 years old. And all I need, I don't need money, just people to listen. Can we retrain ourselves and even teach the next generation the value of being of service to others, to honor Mother Earth, to honor our animals, to honor one another, to respect the sovereign dignity of each individual. The best thing you can do, if you find yourself in this Illuminati in any way, the best thing you can do to absolve yourself of any karmic debt is to come forward as an insider, as a whistleblower. If you dedicate your life in service and you are willing to speak out and act on behalf of the greater good for humanity, you better believe that you can get your ticket to the ascension. You can make a difference by becoming a hero. If you become a hero, if you do the right thing, you do not have to be condemned, you do not have to miss out on this ascension process. So I believe we must remember that the spiritual forces that exist on earth are real, 
that the different teachers from different religious backgrounds did come in with a message. There is a consistency to that message. This is the angelic positive agenda. It is to teach us the importance of love, positivity, compassion, long-suffering, patience, forgiveness, and understanding. And once we embrace and live by these principles, we are bringing ourselves into vibrational accordance with this higher truth. It is a very exciting future, and it is a future that I am willing to fight for and that I spend every day of my life to prepare us for. That is the mission. That is the objective. That is the ascension. And that is the cosmic secret. of science and spirituality. The choice is up to each of us, but the answer is yours and yours alone. Will you choose fear or will you choose love? That is the only question.
When I became a photographer, I wanted to celebrate the elegance and beauty of nature. But I soon realized there was a more complex story going on in the world about the collision between people and nature. And I felt a great sense of urgency to bear witness to that. You're okay.